Well, hello, my friends. We meet again. It's been a while. Where should we begin? The Unforgiven trilogy of songs has always stood out to me Metallica's discography. Not only is a trilogy of songs rare in music, but a trilogy of songs from the biggest metal band in the world is bound to draw my attention. The Unforgiven trilogy spans over 17 years, with the first part being released on the Black Album in 1991, the second part being on Reload from 1997, and the third part being a part of Death Magnetic, which was released 10 years later in 2000. 2008. These songs have always stood out to me on their respective albums as they all contain very unique elements which help the song distinguish itself from the others on these albums. The original Unforgiven being a triumph in production and arrangement, The Unforgiven 2 bringing in some country elements as well as throwing back to the original a little bit, and The Unforgiven 3 deviates the most musically from the others while being perhaps the most poignant lyrically. So today in this video we'll be diving deep into the Unforgiven trilogy, looking at the music theory, lyrical themes, common elements and differences that make these three songs so special, as well as finding out once and for all where that famous horn sound comes from. This is the Unforgiven Trilogy Retrospective. Before we begin, if you enjoy my content, consider supporting me on Patreon, you know, like and share the video and leave a comment down below telling me about your thoughts on the Unforgiven songs. I have a whole bunch of other deep dives on various other songs, which you can check out here, as well as a couple other videos on Metallica themselves. So please go check that out if you're interested. And without any further self shilling, let's get into the meat of it here. Sequels are fairly rare in music, mostly found in literature and films where the setting and stories can be much more directly communicated and explained. In music, it is a little bit different as music is a lot more abstract and open to interpretation. It is difficult to write a sequel to a song and manage to borrow elements and themes from the first one without it sounding like a direct ripoff or a copy. Despite these challenges, Metallica have seen to strike a very nice balance here between these three songs. One and two are far more close related musically together than 3, yet The Unforgiven 3 still feels solidly a part of the trilogy, mostly due to its arrangements, structures, and lyrical themes, you know, all of which we will get to later. In metal music, you almost never see direct numbered sequels, and honestly, I'm not entirely sure why, and if you have any thoughts on this matter or any other trilogies of songs, you know, be sure to comment down below with them. I would love to hear them, perhaps make a video on those in the future. The Unforgiven songs have always been some of my favorite Metallica tracks. The stories, uniqueness, and melodies have always captivated me. From hearing The Unforgiven 1 countless times on rock radio as a child, to discovering that it had a sequel when I got older and bought my own CDs, to then seeing Death Magnetic being released and looking at the track listing and seeing The Unforgiven 3 on it and becoming just so excited to hear it. You know, these songs only seem to get better with age and the lyrics only really seem to become more and more profound and relevant to me as I get older. These songs hold a special place in my heart as part of my metal odyssey, and honestly, I'm even more infatuated by these songs at 20 than I was at 14 years old. We'll be going through each song and first analyzing each one individually, going first through the song's musical elements and then the lyrics afterwards. After this, we will take a look at the three songs together as a musical and lyrical group or cohesive unit to see how they all relate to each other and how they expand the story being told here. But to summarize them quickly, you can sort of keep it in mind as we go through them here that in general, The Unforgiven 1 is about not being able to forgive them, The Unforgiven 2 is about not being able to forgive you, and The Unforgiven 3 is about not being able to forgive yourself. Now, just who is them and you will be explained later on in the lyrics section. And I know that a lot of these songs relate to some things which happened personally to James, and we'll go through that later on when we look at them all together. But for the most part here, I'm just simply going to analyze these songs as they are. As in, what are the songs trying to tell us rather than trying to relate them to James's personal life experiences? These songs are strong enough to stand on their own and tell a story without needing to expand on the background experience of the songwriters. Yeah, like I said, I will touch on that later on in the video near the end. I will also not be discussing the music videos as The Unforgiven 3 didn't get one, so to me there's no real point. Although, 
I do find it curious that they didn't release a single cut of The Unforgiven 3. You know, edit it down to around 5 minutes, cut the intro, and you could easily have a good single. Oh well, anyways. And when we get to the end, we will take a big picture look at how all of them relate musically and lyrically. And just a final housekeeping note here, from here on end to save me from repeating the word Unforgiven hundreds of times during this video, I will sometimes be referring to these songs as simply 1, 2, and 3. Uh, I know you guys are all smart enough to be alright with this, so when I refer to The Unforgiven 1 as 1, just no, I'm not referring to the track one for Man Justice for All, and if I do mention that song, I will make it explicitly clear. Also, if you want to know my thoughts on the albums that all these songs are off, go watch my Metallica vs. Megadeth video. I review and go through every single Metallica album on there and give it a review and a score. So if you don't want to know my thoughts, go there. All right, finally, thus with enough lollygagging, let us begin this retrospective with the original Unforgiven. The Unforgiven One, composed by James Hetfield, Lars Ulrich, and Kirk Hammett. Produced by James Hetfield, Lars Ulrich, and Bob Rock. The Unforgiven One was released on Metallica's Mighty Black album. It was the second single off that record and was released in late 1991, a few months after the single for Enter Sandman. The song is famous for reversing the quote tried and true ballad structure of a melodic and light verse with a heavy and dynamic chorus. The band instead had the opposite idea, heavy verses with a light and melodic chorus section. This reverse and dynamic certainly helps the Unforgiven stand out as, you know, even now, the formula it uses here is not very commonplace. It's still kind of unusual, to be honest. We also have to imagine ourselves in 1991, where this was a seriously fresh, innovative approach to the classic metal ballad, and you really have to give the band and producer Bob Rock credit here for their use of a wide array of sounds, instruments, and percussion on this song. A true masterclass in arrangement and production. Which, as we go through it here, I will make sure to point out where these cool uses of them are. And why not start with that famous horn that opens the song? Immediately recognizable, this lone horn sound slowly increases in volume before the track begins. A very unique way to start a song, one which was so iconic and memorable that Metallica would reuse it again for The Unforgiven 2. Now, what, where exactly is this horn sound from? There's some controversy and conspiracy over where this horn sound is and where it came from. Wikipedia suggests that Hetfield claimed it was taken from the 1960 spaghetti western The Unforgiven, which, you know, would make sense thematically, but when you dive deep Deeper. The source cited for this, which was the classic album's TV show episode on the Black Album, the band does not even tell you where it was from. The top was lifted from somewhere and turned backwards so no one knows who or where it came from. But <laughs> Luckily, a Reddit user claimed it was from the Clint Eastwood film for a few dollars more. The horn sample is most likely from this movie soundtrack on the track entitled El Copo, El Capo, something like that, it's Italian at around 41 seconds. The horn here is sampled. Reversed. And then lowered 400 cents to E, which you can see right here. Combined with a fade in, and we have essentially a perfect match. It could also be this part, but not reversed. But in the clip, James said that it was reversed, so I am almost certain that this is the actual sample. This is where the Unforgiven horn was, for sure. But by far, this is the closest I have found. On the record, this horn sound is faded in, layered with a roll on the snare drum, which was not on the original sample, so Lars must have added it to give it some extra flavor. It sounds like there are two horns playing, really. The main one is playing an E and is by far the most prominent note, but it sounds like it is layered with another horn playing an A, which also happens to be the lowest two strings on a guitar tuned to standard. The horn sound sets the mood perfectly. It's dark, 
full attention due to these E and A notes, which is either in a perfect fifth or suspended fourth interval. It builds in volume along with the snare roll until the bell hits, which is layered with a full fourth snare hit, snapping us into the song. This song, or rather this intro section, is undoubtedly inspired by the same movie, as well as other spaghetti western soundtracks. Unforgiven's got a little Spanish classical, which is nothing new. We've used that thing before. The classical nylon guitar, combined with the sporadic snare rolls, which sound like field snares, which is often used in tense moments in movies. Another ambience is very much influenced by these movies and their soundtracks. Great stuff and a very unique influence to have in a metal song, one which adds a ton of flavor and character and uniqueness to the song. The other guys hate me for it, but I really like some country western stuff. I wanted to put it in somewhere and I did. The nylon guitar plays an A5 add 9 arpeggio, which at the end of every bar is turned into an A minor arpeggio by simply placing his finger onto the first fret of the B string. This little motif here will be repeated and used throughout the song. It also establishes the key of the song being an A minor. Metallica is no stranger to beautiful acoustic playing, and this is a great use of it here. The add nine chord really gives the intro here a lot of tension. Great stuff, and it works well. Iconic, excellent. As the intro moves on, we get a subtle bass synth swell underneath and the clean guitar lead comes in. These again sound very much influenced by spaghetti western soundtracks, even down to the twangy sound of the guitars. The clean guitar, similar to the acoustic, plays a melody which will be elaborated further on into the song. They will reuse it and add to it basically. Various percussion elements occurred here as well, with short snare rolls, a hi-hat, and what I think are castanets being played. All of these add up to a very full and rich sounding intro. The band pedals the A minor chord here so that when the full band comes in and the chords finally change, it gives it that much more impact and we know for sure that the song has started. Truly a very remarkable and memorable intro to a song which sets the mood and acts as a base for the rest of the song to be built upon and to come back to in some cases. As the full band comes in, the nylon guitar plays the same A5 add 9 arpeggio, but slower before changing chords to the C. The lead twangy guitar elaborates on what it was playing before here as well, and this is just a very cool way to progress these ideas and these motifs. Masterful songwriting here, really. The chord progression goes A minor, C major, G major to E minor, which when phrased in numerical values is a minor 1, major 3, major 7, minor 5 progression which remember this for later. However, the second time around, the band plays A minor, C major, G major, E major, changing the E minor chord into E major. The G sharp that is being played here gives the song an A harmonic minor feel to it. adding to the Spanish, you know, Latin feel of the song. A small touch, but one that certainly elevates the song. Lars's drums sound absolutely gigantic, and as I mentioned in my previous video on Metallic vs. Megadeth, I legitimately think that this album has the best drum sound of all time, and they stand out even more in this song, as there's a lot of softer, more acoustic parts that really lets the drums shine. Essentially, instrumentally here, the band is playing the chorus to the song. The lead melody alludes to the vocal melody, which will be placed on top of this section later on. Really just utterly fantastic songwriting here, and the way that they reuse this in the chorus, you know, it introduces these ideas before we hear the chorus, when the chorus comes, it almost feels like we're coming back home. You know, great songwriting, and it's just so beautiful. After this intro section, which contains the chorus, the band goes back to the opening motif briefly before the verse section comes in. The verse, as mentioned previously, is the heaviest part of the song, which is very different from most ballad arrangements where the energy is highest during the chorus or perhaps the solo section. Here, however, Metallica flips this dynamic and gives the, these verses the most energy. 
The guitars and bass play this very cool riff, which uses the open E, A, and D strings to produce these very gorgeous yet heavy dyad chords. These quad track guitars sound absolutely massive, and check out the isolated tracks of these out, just fantastic, huge, massive riffs. And we get the first lines of lyrics from James here. New blood joins this earth, and quickly he is subdued. Through constant pained disgrace, the young boy learns their rules. With time the child draws in, this whipping boy done wrong. Deprived of all his thoughts, the young man struggles on and on. These lyrics are sung over top of the heavy verse riff, and together they produce some gorgeous guitar and vocal interplay. Especially on the lines, and quickly he subdued, and this whipping boy done wrong. where James sings up to the G and the F sharp. This F sharp note, which is also out of the key of A minor, gives this part some very interesting melodic interest as it is sung over the D5 chord. In the key of A minor, D minor is usually the chord used, but instead here, James sings the major third of D, which is the F sharp. Very cool, and it fits the song so well that you probably didn't even notice that he's left the key at all. A great example of borrowing chords from a parallel key. Here is what it would sound like if he stayed in key and instead sang the minor third. Quite a big difference. Like I said earlier, I will get to the meaning of the lyrics a little bit later, but a lot of these lines are very cool sounding and catchy on their own right. Especially the two previously mentioned lines. Top was lifted from somewhere and turned backwards so no one knows who or where it came from. But <laughs> I went on it better than on this song here. And he's really just on another level here on this song. His voice is so powerful with a very gruff and aggressive undertone to it. Pain disgrace. The young boy learns their rules. You can really feel the emotions in his voice. Absolutely fantastic stuff here, and just great singing with a really gruff, gruff grit to it. Excellent. There's a shortened bar of 2 4 as the band moves into the pre chorus. Lars does a cool little tom fill, and we get some subtle strings underneath the guitars. I'm not really sure what synth was used to make these sounds, but being as it was the early 90s, it probably was a Korg N1. Every other bar here in the pre-chorus, Lars omits the snare drum, and in the preceding bar, he plays a snare drum on the count of two, as well as an eighth note after. Same on the four. This gives the pre-chorus a much needed percussive differentiation drum-wise from the rest of the song. It's just a nice little touch as essentially Lars is really playing the same drum beat the rest of the song. The guitars play a riff much more centered around holding power chords here in the pre-chorus, although during the little tom groove that Lars does, the guitars join and play this cool little descending pattern. James sings these lyrics. On and on he's known. Oh, a vow unto his own, that never from this day his will they'll take away. As James sings the last line of the pre-chorus, his voice changes from the gruff sound that he normally uses here to the softer sound that he will use in the chorus. It is a cool little element that prepares the listener for the change of dynamics to come. His will they'll take away. The electric guitars land on that big open A power chord and they fade out into the chorus as the chorus hits. We've already discussed the underlying instrumentation underneath it here, and essentially the band is just playing the same thing as before, this time only with James's soft, vulnerable, and iconic singing over top of it. Percussion-wise, they also add small flourishes of a tambourine on every other snare hit. A nice touch to accentuate and add some extra rhythmic flair. James sings, What I've felt, what I've known, never shined through in what I've shown, never be, never see. Won't see what might have been. What I've felt, what I've known, 
Never shine through in what I've shown. Never free. Never me. So I dub thee Unforgiven. Truly just some very poetic and beautiful lyrics here in the chorus. The contrast and dynamics between the verse and chorus is pretty stark, and honestly it almost makes the soft chorus hit even harder than the heavy verse. It almost causes you to lean forward and listen more carefully to it. An honestly brilliant move by the band, and despite being sung softly, the vocals here are doubled, which is used to make the vocal line more powerful and to stand out in the mix. And doing what I've shown, never be, never see. The melody James sings over the chorus is very elegant. It almost doesn't even sound like him, really. And the chorus vocals make great use of repetition, and because of all these factors, it is extremely catchy, especially the what I've felt and what I've known lines. You know, in addition to Enter Sandman, these are probably the most known lyrics from all of Metallica's career. The clean lead, twang guitar, and vocal melody expertly complement each other, weaving in and out of unison and harmony, truly just fantastic musicianship and songwriting here. Then when combined with the acoustic guitar playing its own little melody as well, oh man, it is just absolutely so gorgeous. Here are the lead and vocal melodies played together on a piano. Now add in the acoustic guitar. You know, really, I cannot say enough about how great this chorus is. Seamlessly switching back and forth from A minor to A harmonic minor, with interesting melodies and counter melodies and unison parts, parts that come in and out of harmony, it just really is a master class chorus. Combine this all with extremely catchy vocal melodies and lyrical hooks, and truly no wonder why this song was such a huge radio success. Never The last line of the chorus, the hook of the entire song, So I Dub Thee Unforgiven, is sung with a few layers here. First off, it is very poetic in prose. To me, it sounds like the main vocal line finishes on the A note and is harmonized with a lower octave in A, a low C note, which is the minor third of A minor, and another C a whole octave higher than that one. So I dub thee unforgiven. So we have two A's and two C's. So as well as resolving the chorus back to its root key, it also acts as a very final way to resolve this chorus. Good stuff and a great strategic use of vocal harmonies, which in, for the most part, the song is lacking in. As the chorus ends, the vocals slightly hang over into the next bar and we get another repeat of the acoustic motif from the intro, followed by a simple but huge drum fill from Lars and we move into the second verse. They dedicate their lives. James sings the following lyrics. They dedicate their lives to running all of his. He tries to please them all, this bitter man he is. Throughout his life the same, He's battled constantly. This fight he cannot win. A tired man, they see, no longer cares. The second verse is pretty much the same instrumentally, besides Lars's snare fill as the bitter man he is line ends. Speaking of, you can really hear the venom in James's voice in this verse, especially on the line that I just mentioned. He almost seems to spit that line out, like, this bitter man he is. The second pre-chorus is much the same as the first, with different lyrics. The old man then prepares to die regretfully. That old man here is me. Man, 
James again barks the lyrics out, and you can feel the emotion and anger in his voice. I find the line, quote, the old man then prepares to die regretfully, end quote, to be an especially poignant and powerful line. Then the revelation that the old man is him, oh man, it's just very powerful and moving lyrics here, but uh, there's a lot more layers to this section here, and we'll get to that later on, so stay tuned. Another chorus plays, notably with Lars doing some interesting fills on the hi-hat as well as some different vocal variations. Never be, never see, Before the chorus ends with a similar vocal harmony as the first, and we get a repeat of the acoustic motif intro again, although this time it is harmonized very subtly. You can really only hear it on the isolated tracks, but it's just a nice, nice little touch. Then the band subverts our expectations, as instead of going to another verse, we get a different lead melody played over top of it, and a much more traditional sounding metal clean sound. No longer the spaghetti western twangy sound, instead it sounds to me to be kind of very jazzy. Kirk plays a small little lead pattern before him, and the band plays an ascending melody right before the heavy guitars, drums, and bass all come back in under the solo. We then get the solo section here, which has one of my favorite Metallica solos in it, but more than that, it has my favorite solo riff from Metallica in it as well. The riff underneath the solo is very similar to the verse riff, but rather than the open string dyads, James plays these super thick, chunky power chords underneath it. complete with a very cool little guitar fill as well. The solo here is certainly one of Kirk's best, not his fastest or most intense, nor the most technically impressive, but the emotion pouring out of his hands is very hypnotizing. I can almost hear the sweat dripping onto his pickups. It is very bluesy and it contrasts very well with the small little jazzy lick he played right before. According to Kirk himself, the solo was mostly improvised, which would later on lead him to improvise more and more solos, uh, for better or for worse. In this case though, it works fantastically. The solo feels desperate and angry, almost like it is battling with these people which the lyrics speak of. Excellent stuff from Kirk Hammock here, and just, yeah, fantastic solo. As the solo continues, the pre-chorus is played again by the instruments, though this time with some extra strings added underneath as a nice little added touch. Lars plays with the feel of the rhythm here with these double snare hits, which is very similar to the pre-choruses. And the solo reaches its climax shortly before the last chorus, and everyone ends on this huge E power chord, including Kirk. Just a great way to end a solo. It's just final, like, <clears throat> Sorry. Then we get the last chorus repeated. Again, most of the same with some different vocal variations and drum fills. However, after this last little chorus, the band goes into this little coda here, which sees a few lines from the chorus repeated over and over as the song fades out. The way the song fades out gives the song a very unresolved feel, which is a nice little touch which relates greatly to the lyrics. So that was the song from a music standpoint, and you know, it's just fantastic. Easily one of my favorite songs of all time. The uniqueness of the light chorus and heavy verse combined with the harmonic minor sound and all the various different sounds, percussion, and influence have created a mighty magnum opus from Metallica here. Just well done. I love the song. Fantastic.
And so now that we've gone through the music side of the song, let us take a look at the lyrics here. As I alluded to earlier in the video, the Unforgiven one is, I cannot forgive them. But who is them? In general, this them is the general term for society or authority figures. We could also view this as the general prevailing culture. This general them or society beats down people spiritually and forces them to conform. This process is essential for cultures and societies to continue existing. In Individuals must be forcibly made to conform to the rules and mores of society, lest too many break these rules and the culture dies or society strays too far from its original form. You know, an object in motion wants to stay in motion. It's one of the laws of physics, which also applies to human beings and culture. And this happens to every single person in every single society, and those who don't are beaten, killed, jailed or ostracized completely. This is a vital process for society and the people who are most vigilant about ensuring the continuation and perpetuation of society are authority figures, religious teachers, and on a smaller scale, parents and friends also perpetuate this. For some people, conforming comes very easily. Social pressures can be immense and simply submitting and becoming a part of the larger culture or society is only natural. However, for those who find themselves at odds with the larger culture or in disagreement with some things, this process can be extremely painful and traumatic. This is where the lyrics from one begin. The first line of the song is, quote, new blood joins this earth and quickly he's subdued. Through constant pain disgrace, the young boy learns their rules, end quote. Which, you know, let me just quickly say is a fantastic opening stanza. Here, right from day one, as soon as one joins this earth, you are pressured by society into behaving a certain way. This process for the narrator of the song, which we can assume in a very broad sense is James and his own experiences, was painful from day one. Quote, this whipping boy done wrong, end quote makes it clear that the narrator feels that this process is unfair to him and that society has wronged him, that he is his own individual and society is just not for him. The next line elaborates on this, quote, Deprived of all his thoughts, the young man struggles on and on he's known, a vow unto his own that never from this day his will they'll take away, end quote. So here it seems that the narrator's true self his internal being is at odds with the culture that society and authority figures pressure upon him. And what happens when there is a threat to the order and stability of the culture? Well, it attacks it and attempts by force for it to conform. However, the narrator makes a vow to never relent to their pressure and to never let them take away his own will. This is paired with the heavy verse sections and the very angry, bitter delivery of James Hetfield give these lines extra venom. The chorus, which is repeated throughout the song several times, repeats these few lines over and over again, which are driven into our heads. Quote, What I felt, what I've known, never shined through in what I've shown. Never be, never see, won't see what might have been. These lines are paid with the softer sections of the song. Essentially here, the narrator, perhaps in moments of self-reflection at night or in quiet at times, is lamenting at the loss of what might have been. Quote, won't see what might have been. What he has felt and known inside him was never reflected in the outside world. His internal beliefs were at odds with the social pressures around him, and because of that, his internal self or true being was repressed. He has to hide it deep inside. He will never see nor be what he could have been due to the mistreatment from society he received. This causes massive trauma to the person, and he makes a vow to never let them do this again. And these lines are repeated over and over through the song, which almost comes off as mantra-like. He repeats this to himself to keep himself strong and true to his inner self. Perhaps this chorus is just the vow he made to himself. The line which ends the chorus, quote, So I dub thee unforgiven, end quote, is very interesting. I mentioned earlier that this is a very poetic way to phrase it. The poetic prose may refer to a more religious and older way to speak, specifically the use of the word the. Now, I'm not going to give you a full linguistics lesson nor history of the English language, but bear with me for just a second and you may learn something. In English, the word thee is the oblique second person informal use of the word thou. Now thou, and by extension the word thee, is largely archaic and almost never used outside of religious texts, ceremonies, and art. Thou was the informal version of the second person use of the word you. Formality is largely extinct from English, 
although many other languages retain this function. If you know any German, for example, you would know of the do and z distinction. This worked almost the same way in Old English. And in extremely simple terms, thou would be used in place of you when using second person language that was not referencing multiple people or when addressing someone you were familiar with or a person who was lower down the societal totem pole from you. So just for a quick example, the phrase, you have a car would be, thou hast a car, or in the case of the unforgiven, instead of I dub thee unforgiven, in modern English, we would say I dub you unforgiven. The use of the word thee here denotes that this is referencing a singular individual. You and thou would also be used to differentiate between single, singular and plural. Think of you and you all today and y'all today, right? Or it is used in religious settings to denote a personal relationship with God. Think thou hast given me the strength, just for an example. So the use of the word thee here is very interesting. Not only is it referencing a personal intimate relationship, it also introduces religious overtones and gives us a sense of double meaning here. Is the narrator naming God unforgiven for the punishment and pain of his life cursing him essentially? Is he speaking to an authority figure directly? Or was this a line that an authority figure said to him? Think of a leader in society dubbing this non-conforming child unforgiven and essentially giving up on him. It's a very fascinating line that has tons and tons of depth to it once you peel back the layers. So let me know what your thoughts on it below. To me, I believe this is the narrator remembering this event. It comes at the end of the mantra, this mantra which he repeats and give some strength to endure the pain of being the unforgiven person. Mull on this and I'll come back to it at the end of the lyric section here. The second verse gives us more insight into the life and treatment of the narrator. How these people continue to attempt to control and seemingly dedicate their lives to ruining his. And despite all this trauma, he tries his best to please them all, despite how bitter their treatment has made him. This is a fight he can never win, a fight that we can never win. These societal and cultural pressures are inescapable unless you want to go live as a vagabond in the woods or something. Thus, until the very end of his life, the narrator endures the disgrace and pain, and in the end, he remains unforgiven and dies with many regrets. The narrator reveals that this old man dying is actually him, or perhaps he sees this old man as a premonition of his life. Perhaps this old man was another one of the unforgiven, and the narrator watching this happen sees his future in the old man. Seeing this old man dying with so many regrets gives him a different change of thought, maybe for example. Very thought-provoking lyrics here. The chorus repeats this mantra several more times again, then near the end of the song we get these repeated lines which reveal more about the line, so I dub thee unforgiven. Quote, You label me, I'll label you, so I dub thee unforgiven. End quote. These lines essentially give us some clarity to the question I posed earlier. They labeled him as unforgiven, so in turn, he will also never forgive them. He is unforgiven, so they are unforgiven. They wrote the narrator off for having his own will and for daring to have his own thoughts. Thus, the cycle continues, and during the narrator's life, he sees a future version of himself, this old man. He sees himself in this old dying man, who is also part of the unforgiven. The old man dies regretfully, but as the closing lines disclose to us, quote, never free, never me, so I dub thee unforgiven. End quote. Freedom to do his own thing, then, is what is required to be himself. Thus, without this freedom, he can never forgive them. This relates a lot to the other songs on the Black Album, a lot of which revolve around the concept of freedom being the ultimate good, including the album art, but that is a topic for another video. Control or resistance to control is a very common topic in Metallica songs, and the Unforgiven one here is probably the most personal and internal representation of this. So, to summarize, the narrator was forced by society to conform, he was humiliated, disgraced, and whipped into doing so. Yet he could never do this, he could never conform, as he must be his own person to be free. Thus, when he is labeled as unforgiven, he then in turn will never forgive them for doing so. However, he sees an old man dying regretfully. This old man was a vision of his future, of what happens when someone lives their whole life unforgiven. This perhaps will spark a change in the narrator to not end up like this old man, which then sets the scene for the sequel, which we will get to right away. All in all, just a fantastic song, easily one of my favorites in their entire catalog. The lyrics and heavy verse, light chorus make the song extremely powerful and memorable. The production of the song is masterclass and tasteful additions. James's vocals are powerful yet vulnerable and extremely catchy. And it's no wonder why the song made it to number 25 of the Billboard Hot 100 charts, which 
if you know, is essentially to the pop music charts. A true achievement in music by Metallica, and what more can you say about The Unforgiven One? Just fantastic, fantastic stuff. A masterclass in songwriting. Bravo. The Unforgiven Two, composed by James Hetfield, Lars Ulrich, and Kirk Hammett. Produced by James Hetfield, Lars Ulrich, and Bob Rock. The Unforgiven 2 was released on Reload in 1997, and then was also released as a single in early 1998. Although the single for 2 did not break the top 40 of the Hot 100 like 1 did, it still made it to a very, very respectable number 59. It also actually charted higher on the US mainstream rock charts, reaching number 2. 2 starts off with a direct reference to 1. The horn and snare roll intro is taken directly from the intro to 1, and to my ears, I can't really hear any discernible differences. This immediately puts the first song in mind. Even if you did not know the name of the song while listening to the CD, you instantly know that the song is referencing The Unforgiven One. However, in contrast to One, the band goes straight into the whole band playing together. There is no lone guitar intro here. The transition from horn to intro section is a little bit jarring and not nearly as smooth as one. This is due to the fact that rather than being in the key of A minor like the first song, this song is in the key of A flat minor. First off, it gives the song a darker feel to it, but it also helps differentiate it from the Unforgiven One. This is accomplished by the band tuning a half step down to E flat standard guitar tuning. If you remember from earlier, the horn was playing uh, E and A note layered together so that when the band is playing in the key of A flat, it does not flow as well or as easily as in one. And perhaps this was intentional. I mean, easily they could have lowered the horns one semitone and would have been in the same key, but in a way the jarring transition works to differentiate the song completely from one. You know, like saying this is not the same song. Either way, the song starts with the band playing a short little riff passage with power chords and Kirk playing octaves over top of it. It has a slightly dirty grungy sound to it, which fits the song in neatly to the rest of Load and Reload. And I just have to say that the drums don't sound nearly as good as they did on one. A victim of the late 90s trend in metal to have the driest drum sounds possible. Layered underneath the distorted electric guitars, you can hear a shimmering acoustic strumming open cowboy chords layered underneath. The intro section plays for four bars and similar to one, we will see this intro motif used again and again throughout the song. A nice little callback to one without it being too obvious. Then with the simple choke, the band stops and we get a lone clean guitar. This guitar has a ton of country twang to it and honestly, I love it. This dark outlaw country sound fits in perfectly with the rest of the songs from Load and Reload, which also feature this outlaw country influence all over them. This riff is unusual for Metallica and metal bands in general, as James plays it with a Telecaster equipped with a B bender string attachment thing, I guess you would call it. This essentially allows the guitar player to bend the B string by itself by pushing the guitar into the body of the player. It creates a very cool effect, one which is very, very country. You can see him playing it in the music videos here as well as in a live show. The device allows the user to bend the B string independently and always to the same note, which is a full tone higher in pitch. It almost gives the sound of the Telecaster a pedal steel flavor, and James uses this to great effect here, especially as here before the verse starts, it is just the lone guitar playing, so it really gets its own chance to shine. The lone guitar gets four bars to itself, and halfway through this guitar intro, we get a little lead melody from Kirk. It sounds like there's an octave doubler pedal effect maybe on this melody here. The chord progression that the band plays here is the same progression as the chorus of The Unforgiven One. 
which if you remember from earlier is a minor one, major three, major seven, minor five chord progression. It's played half a step down though, due to the band playing an E flat tuning. So rather than A minor, C major, G major, E minor, as it was in the first song, it is just a half step down. So we have this progression of A flat minor, B major, G flat major, and E flat minor. Although different to the Unforgiven one, the band does not introduce the harmonic minor feel to it at all. It just gives it that small amount of continuity between the two tracks. Hey, editing Barbus here. Just a really quick, you heard how the chord progressions matched the same in the intro. In the intro, I just took the two songs and lowered the Unforgiven One's melodies and chords to be in A flat minor. So you heard how they're the same in the intro. So if you want to hear that, just go listen to the intro little uh, medley again there. It is also worthy of note that this chord progression is also played during the softer or light verses while the heavy chorus deviates from this progression. A nice little touch here as the key being different enough differentiates it enough that you probably didn't even notice it was the same progression until now. <laughs> Which, speaking of, the band decided to drop the light chorus heavy verse gimmick for The Unforgiven 2. A decision which I respect, as the songs would probably be far too similar if they did the same thing over again. Although, they do bring this idea back for 3, but we will get to that in short order. James sings, Lay beside me and tell me what they've done, And speak the words I want to hear to make my demons run. The door is locked now, but it's open if you're true. If you can understand the me, then I can understand the you. His vocal style is much different from the Black Album. He is singing in a lower register first of all, and there's much less grit in his voice. James's voice was damaged during the recording of the Black Album, specifically the cover of So What. This led him to finally get a vocal coach and a rehab program. Both of these things will change a person's voice, and while his singing voice is a lot more polished than previous efforts, I find that it misses a lot of the personality and untrained aggression from the Black Album. On this song, his voice is a lot more vibrato, and he slides around between notes a little bit more. You can definitely tell that James was influenced vocal-wise by a lot of the grunge singers of this era in music. Although he never goes full Jarl, but he does use a more nasally approached as compared to the throaty Black Album. We'll get to the lyrics at the end here, but I like the little callback to one. Quote, if you can understand the me, then I can understand the you. End quote. This here is a pretty much an explicit reference to the quote, you label me, I'll label you, end quote, line which is a nice little touch. After this first verse stanza, the band then goes back to the opening intro motif. Although this time, James is simply playing a clean guitar pattern while Kirk and the rest of the band plays the same thing as before. Similar to The Unforgiven One, the band uses the intro motif often and throughout the song, a pattern which also continues into The Unforgiven Three. The second part of verse 1 here adds a very interesting effect-laden picking pattern in the right speaker. Under wicked sky, through back of day. It's an interesting pattern, mostly just picking chord arpeggios, and it's pretty hard to hear, but you can hear it in the isolated tracks quite well. Kirk then plays the same lead melody he played during the lone guitar part, before the first verse. As the door cracks open, but there's no... A nice little touch and use of repetition here. James sings, Lay beside me under wicked skies. Through black of day, dark of night, we share this paralyzed. The door cracks open, but there's no sun shining through. Black heart scarring darker still, but there's no sun shining through. No, there's no sun shining through. No, there's no sun shining. Here in these lyrics is a nice little double entendre. On the word paralyzed, it sounds as if James is saying pair of lies. Dark of night, we share this paralyzed. And honestly, until I went and looked up the lyrics for these songs in this video, this is indeed what I thought he was saying. I am unsure if this was intentional wordplay or simply just a uh, happy coincidence. But, you know, let's just believe it was on purpose, <laughs> shall we? <laughs> 
A nice little harmony on the line, quote, Blackheart scarring darker still, end quote, brings us into the pre-chorus. As the band moves into the pre-chorus, we get several elements from the pre-chorus in The Unforgiven One returning. It is two bars of four beats with one bar of two beats, which is essentially the same structure from one. Lars also uses the toms to transition and differentiate the drum beats from the verse and chorus. Nice little touches again to throw it back to the earlier song. You can also hear some strings being played in the background, but they are extremely subtle and barely audible. Just a nice little touch though. As the chorus for two comes in, we're immediately presented with another throwback to one with the lines, quote, what I felt, what I've known, end quote. These iconic opening chorus lines are sung with much aggression and are paired with the heavy instrumentation, which right away sets it apart from one. Then as the lyrics and melody deviate from the original, it subverts your expectations and makes you listen with an interested ear. Again, they did a very nice job borrowing elements from one, but changing it just enough to keep it familiar and yet fresh. The way a good sequel should operate in theory. I'm the dog. Again, as in one, a tambourine is used as extra percussion here in the chorus, as James sings, What I felt, what I've known, turn the pages, turn the stone. Behind the door, should I open it for you? Yeah, what I felt, what I've known, sick and tired, I stand alone. Could you be there, cause I'm the one who waits for you? Or are you unforgiven too? I really like the chorus in the song. It is very, very strong. The riff underneath is cool. And I especially like the little guitar fill they use after the line, should I open it for you. It sort of reminds me of the fill used during the solo of one. They add some nice harmonies under the main vocal line during the lines, quote, behind the door, end quote. And then later on, quote, could you be there? Although they do not continue these harmonies till the end lines of the chorus. In contrast to one, the harmonies end here and the end line is not harmonized, which on the Unforgiven One was the only harmonized line of the chorus. Nice little touch. As well as another little differentiation, the lyrics on the Unforgiven 2 start on the downbeat rather than on the Unforgiven where they start on the upbeat. I really like the vocal delivery of the line, quote, sick and tired, I stand alone, end quote. James delivers it with some serious bitterness in his voice and kind of brings back some memories of the Black Album. The chorus ends with another homage to one, although this one, you know, is very obvious. He asks the question, or are you unforgiven too? Referencing the damning line of, so I dub thee unforgiven. Although this one is another double entendre. Obviously the lyrics are not meant to be taken this way. Uh, you could see it as the unforgiven two, as in the number two. And I think this choice in line was a little tongue in cheek here, but it's a good and catchy ending line made all the better with this double meaning. I wonder if this one line was what the entire song was written about. You know, a good hook which references the original but gives us more to go with. You know, he thought to himself, are you unforgiven too? Unforgiven too? I, I don't know, who knows? The band then goes back to that opening intro motif once again before moving into the second verse. Come lay beside me. The second verse here omits the clean country picked riff from earlier, instead replacing it with two effects drenched guitars playing different melodies. The guitar in the right speaker is playing this pattern which sounds a lot like the opening guitar pattern to Dream On by Aerosmith. These sort of pulsating chord dyads with a note in between to complete the chord. It's very cool. And the guitar in the left speaker is playing this nice little melody which sounds like it's being both volume swelled and wah pedaled. Both guitars together create a very cool effect that is pretty striking and it gives verse 2 really its own sound and personality. She loves me still, but she never love again. It also leaves a lot of space for the vocals and lowers the energy somewhat. The lyrics in the second verse are, Come lay beside me, this won't hurt I swear. She loves me not, she loves me still, but she'll never love again. She lay beside me, but she'll be there when I'm gone. Black heart scarring darker still. 
Yes, she'll be there when I'm gone. Yes, she'll be there when I'm gone. Dead sure she'll be there. The second verse gives the vocals many more harmonies, which makes use of the space opened up sonically by the guitars playing these very sporadic and spacey ambient patterns. Maybe sadly, but you'll be there. This line of Blackheart scarring darker still is repeated again, but the following lines change, and we will get to this later, but it is an interesting songwriting tactic to use the same line, but follow it with something else. Gives us the listeners another little earworm to pay attention to, something familiar yet different once again. The strings in this section are a little bit louder than on the first pre-chorus and they help to build tension into the second chorus. The second chorus comes and goes much the same as the first. Really the only way to tell these apart is a few different drum parts and the yeah J James does in the middle. Otherwise this chorus is basically played nearly identical to the first chorus. And there's nothing wrong with that, of course, right? It's a good chorus. Why, why mess with success? As the second chorus ends, we move right into guitar solo, which is very different from one. A nice little touch though, as it keeps the momentum from the chorus going, you know, instead of the momentum from the chorus and then you have the intro motif and then you go back to the heavier parts and set it's just the one, you know, steady energy level. A nice solo from Kirk Hammock, the band underneath Kirk plays once again the opening motif slash riff, whatever you want to call it. As the solo moves into its second section, the band builds up in intensity. Lars plays a double time pattern on the ride complete with as many tom fills as James and Jason play the chorus riff underneath. It is cool as this riff sort of echoes the riff that is played under the solo in one, complete with another cool guitar fill. This does a good job of picking up the pace and intensity while Kirk also plays a little bit more intricate and aggressive runs in this part of the solo. As the solo ends, we essentially get a full repeat of the opening motif slash riff, complete with the same octave lead pattern, just with different drum patterns. It even ends on the same cymbal choke to the lone guitar. And you know, if there's anything I've learned from studying these songs so far is that tasteful and purposeful use of repetition can really make a song feel cohesive and flowing. Metallica does this very well on his track, utilizing this intro motif frequently, but every time it is just a little bit different or it's put in different place in the song. Yeah, I mean, good stuff. For example, they use this motif here as an intro to connect verse one with the second stanza under a guitar solo and then finally as a bridge. The simple choke into the lone B bender guitar riff is a cool dynamic shift from the energy of the solo. It's very sudden, it's, it's good. As the riff plays for the second bar, James comes in with the vocals. Lay beside me, tell me what I've done. The door is closed, so are your eyes. But now I see the sun, now I see the sun. Yes, now I see it. Tell me what I've done, the door is closed so I... The short little phrase that James sings echoes many things from earlier in the song while also echoing the Unforgiven One by playing the same chord progression. So the short little bridge, I guess we can call it, is referring back to both songs. It's a cool touch. Here James sings the lines, quote, tell me what I've done end quote, versus, quote, tell me what they've done, end quote. An interesting change in lyrical themes, which we will speak on later. It's very cool. He also references the door and sun metaphors. In verse one, the door was locked. Verse two, it was cracked open. And here on the bridge, it is closed again. Yet, despite the door being closed, the sun is now visible. Interesting. Just some really fantastic songwriting here. Now I see it. As James sings the last few lines of the small bridge section, he holds the note and bends it upwards, which is different from how the transition from verse to chorus go in both the first and second verses. He bends from D flat to E flat while the band holds this A flat minor chord. This creates a nice increase in energy and serves to bring us to the final chorus as well. Very good singing by James here. You know, he doesn't get a lot of credit for his singing and even I kind of uh, ragged on a little bit earlier in this song, but. Yeah, he's, he's a great singer. This is also accompanied by a small, what sounds to be a synth swell here. All this just adds up to bring up the energy to the final chorus. Yeah, 
As the third chorus plays out very similarly to the first two, we get a beat switch up on the second half by Lars. He plays this sort of syncopated double time of the snare and crashes before giving us a nice fill into the extended chorus outro or coda. Like I've mentioned in my Genius of Lars Ulrich video, he always knows when to add just a little extra to serve the song well, and this third chorus here is a prime example of that. As the band moves into the extended last chorus, or I suppose you could look at it as the coda, we get yet many more throwbacks to one. In the right speaker, we get the iconic twangy riff ringing out of the background. Of course, though, this time it is played a step down, but the production on the guitar sounds to be pretty much the same as in one. This is a nice touch, and to be honest with you guys, it does not feel out of place at all, although I have heard some other people calling it a little bit ham-fisted. You be the judge. The rhythm that the guitar is playing is slightly different and changed to match the rhythm being played by the other instruments. As James sings out the first half of the last chorus, in the left speaker, we hear, quote, So I dub thee Unforgiven. Almost like it is a memory from his past. A nice little touch to tie it all together. James sings a slight variation in the last half of the chorus here. Oh, what I felt. Oh, what I've known. I'll take this key and I'll bury it in you because you're unforgiven too. He gives it some extra sauce here, singing some variations on the melodies. Great stuff. We also get in the right speaker another throwback or another melody we could think of with the line you label me i'll label you lines which are taken directly from the unforgiven one again and it all works together really really well in my opinion great songwriting and i love how the coda brings back all these subtle small touches that the band played in the unforgiven one and brings them all back and brings them together in this cohesive unit and as the coda plays out we get yet another throwback but mixed with a little bit newer stuff Never free, never me, cause you're unforgiven too. Which I think is just another great way to mix the old and new. As James sings his last lines on these O's, he lands on the note of E flat, and then we get what sounds like a slide guitar, which slides up to C, which is the major third interval of E flat, essentially literally ending the song on a happy note, which is very relevant to the story the song is trying to tell. All in all, The Unforgiven 2 is easily the strongest track off Reload in my opinion, blending Metallica's sound with more grunge and country influences very well. In addition to that, the band manages to write something fresh while also retaining lots of elements from The Unforgiven 1. It feels like a solid sequel, they feel related but not the same, familiar yet new, and most importantly, The Unforgiven 2 sounds like it's part of a cohesive unit with The Unforgiven 1. Great stuff. So, now on to the lyrics. It is pretty clear to me that the character in question here is the same character or person from one. Not only does the title of the song relate this to us right away, as it is literally the sequel to the story of the man who cannot forgive society, culture, or authority figures, but the music and lyrics also make this clear that it is part of the same story. So remember a while back when I told you that The Unforgiven 2 is I Cannot Forgive You? Well, who is this you? Is it the same character from The Unforgiven One? Then, who is this you that he cannot forgive? Well, to me, the song tells the story of the man finding someone who is also forgiven. Someone who has also shared similar experiences with culture and society, damaging them and painting them, disgracing them. Yet, despite the fact that they are unforgiven, this person is also a part of society as we all are. So despite the shared experience and trauma, he struggles to forgive this person as he has shut himself off from society, shut himself off from everyone else, which includes this person that he finds common ground with. Let me explain further. This struggle is mentioned many times with the door and key metaphors that are used throughout the song. The door here we can look at as his defensive reaction from the trauma that he has suffered. Doors are gateways to other spaces, and behind this closed door, he hides himself away from others. It is a self-preservation response from the trauma he experienced, and his vow to never let his own will being taken away. We can look at this metaphor as the struggle to open yourself and your heart to others. 
after being hurt. The lyrics detail how the two characters here relate with each other and find common comfort in the shared experience that they have had. Quote, lay beside me, tell me what they've done. Speak the words I want to hear to make my demons run. End quote. The line speak the words I want to hear to make my demons run is very, very powerful. A fantastic poetic line. The line here indicates that not only does the narrator want to find comfort in someone else, but he wants to comfort them in turn, finding comfort within each other, so to speak. Whoever he uses the words, quote, I want to hear, end quote, which indicates to me that he is still closed off. He believes that these words may not be true, but he wants to hear them anyways, showing his desperation. He wants to hear these words spoken to him, even if they are untrue. Yet, it is this mistrust to everyone that makes the door to himself remain closed. Quote, The door is locked now, but it's open if you're true. If you can understand the me, then I can understand the you. End quote. Here is the first mention of the door metaphor, essentially saying here, I am closed off to everyone due to my mistreatment from society, yet if you are truly who you say you are, then my heart can maybe perhaps be open. Like I said earlier, the understand the me line is a throwback to the Unforgiven One, where instead of labeling people, he is trying to understand and relate to them. Very much the opposite of the accusatory nature of the people from the Unforgiven One. Quote, Lay beside me under wicked skies, through black of day, dark of night, we share this paralyzed. End quote. Here they reuse the lay beside me line. Laying beside someone is usually a very intimate body position. Saved only for lovers and family members only. You know, for the most part, of course there are exceptions. The two of them lay together, quote, under wicked skies and dark nights, end quote, which essentially is the metaphor for society, culture, or authority. These dark skies, black nights, and dark days represent the overbearing nature of the societal forces looking down on the unforgiven, darkening their future, darkening their horizons, blocking out the sun. Great metaphor here, and when you combine that with perhaps the unintentional double entendre, that I mentioned earlier on Paralyzed, where they are both paralyzed by the pressure society places upon them, but perhaps they also relate to each other with their, quote, pair of lies, end quote, which again can be looked at as the mistrust that the narrator has still. Intriguing lyrics here, and let me know what you guys think. Is this double entendre intended, or am I just crazy? Am I hearing things? Do you hear this too? Leave it down below. Quote, the door cracks open, but there's no sun shining through. Blackheart scarring darker still, but there's no sun shining through, end quote. Here we see the first use of the sun metaphor. He tends to let this person in to open the door to his heart, yet nothing comes through. The sun here would be a metaphor for love or perhaps acceptance, his black heart still being scarred by everything around them, but he cannot let the sun shine through. The wicked skies and dark nights block this from happening still. Quote, what I've felt, what I've known, turn the pages, turn the stone. Behind the door, should I open it for you? End quote. And here now in the chorus lyrics, we get that throwback directly to the Unforgiven One with the same first lines. The turning of pages and turning of stones is a way to represent a change. And then he asks the question, quote, behind the door, should I open it for you? You know, should he open the door? Can he even open the door? Is it within his power and strength to even do so? Is the person worthy enough? Is he worthy enough of acceptance and love? This is why he's paralyzed. He's paralyzed by the wicked skies and dark nights. He cannot see the sun. Quote, yeah, what I've felt, what I've known. Sick and tired, I stand alone. Could you be there? Cause I'm the one who waits for you? Or are you unforgiven too? End quote. Here the narrator confesses to us that he is sick and tired of being alone. The unrelenting pressure to conform has worn him thin over the years. Perhaps he remembers the old man from the unforgiven one. The one he saw die with many regrets, and he does not want to be like him. He is waiting for someone. He is waiting for a true person to open the door to his heart. He asks, are you unforgiven too? Again, I mentioned the double entendre here. He asks if they are unforgiven, but it is also the title of the song, The Unforgiven Too. And by posing this question, are you unforgiven too? He's asking, are you like me? Can you let people, other people in too? Are you true? Are you unforgiven too? Essentially, there's a lot of meanings packed into that one small line, which is a very common trend here in these Unforgiven songs I've, have, I've started to notice. The second verse sees the narrator now inviting the other person to be with him. Quote, Come lay beside me, this won't hurt I swear. She loves me not, she loves me still, but she'll never love again. She lay beside me, but she'll be there when I'm gone. Black heart scarring darker still, 
yet she'll be there when I'm gone. End quote. Yet despite his invitation and the narrator's want of someone to share his life with, it seems that he's not convinced that he won't hurt the other person. Quote, this won't hurt I swear, and quote, she'll never love again. These lines almost seem to be sarcastic in nature. Perhaps he's trying to convince himself that she doesn't love him, to spare them both the potential for hurt that he has in his blackened, scarred heart. He speaks to this by saying, quote, she lay beside me, but she'll be there when I'm gone, end quote, as if he is expecting himself to hurt her, or perhaps the other way around. These lines are essentially saying that not only does the narrator not trust society and everyone around him, but he does not trust himself either. He does not trust himself to not hurt this other person. He's unforgiven. You know, I can't forgive people and everything around me. So, you know, I can't essentially. The second chorus repeats and is followed by the bridge and solo sections. The bridge verse sees a change in attitude, no longer asking what they've done, but now it is what I have done. A great distinction and evident change within the narrator, which I think is represented by the guitar solo. This internal battle between himself vowing to stand alone and wanting to forgive society and to let someone to his heart. Uh, yeah, it's a great solo and I think it does a great job of representing this challenging battle within the narrator. Sorry, one less interruption. Uh, I just realized I did do a good job of explaining it. The solo does a really good job in this song of representing this internal battle, especially the buildup and how it gets more intense once the chorus comes. You know, the chorus in the song is asking all these questions, so playing the solo over top of the chorus riff, it references these sort of questions that the lyrics are asking, and the solo is trying to answer them in a way, but can they be answered? Can he have a change of heart? You know, we'll have to find out. Quote, lay beside me, tell me what I've done. The door is closed, so are your eyes, but now I see the sun, now I see the sun, Yes, now I see it. It seems that in this bridge, perhaps from his own doing, he has to hurt the other person in some way. A trauma response, so to speak. Yet seeing how he has hurt this other person and how she has now closed off to him, quote, the door is closed, so are your eyes, end quote. He has revealed to him the truth of the matter. He wants love. He wants acceptance. He can see the sun, you know, love and acceptance represented by the sun metaphor, which contrasts with his blackened, scarred heart, wicked skies, and darkened days metaphors, which means the society around them. She is his son. This is combined musically with a lone guitar bridge. It gives this whole small little bridge, to me, the feeling of a sunrise, or perhaps the sun coming out from behind the clouds. It works very well together and paints a very vivid picture. As the chorus repeats again, he asks the narrator the same questions. Yet when the chorus repeats for the last time in the coda, he makes his decision. Despite this, the memories and trauma from his past still haunt him, as evidenced by the lines and motifs and instruments from the Unforgiven One sort of being played back and forth in the speakers around him. You know, this represents the previous trauma echoing through the song and his mind. Here he finally stands as this person is just like him. She is part of the Unforgiven. Quote, I'll take this key and I'll bury it in you because you're unforgiven too, end quote. He takes the key to the locked door to his heart and he buries it within the other person. This is extremely powerful imagery. Burying something usually denotes death in some way, the burial of a person or idea, for example. And by burying the key to his heart in this other person, it represents the metaphorical death of the old narrator. He realizes that him locking himself away is hurting the other person and he cannot stand it. The narrator commits himself fully to the other as the key is now buried within her. And rather than asking if she's unforgiven too, as was the case on the previous choruses, he now states that the reason for committing himself is because she is unforgiven too. They are both unforgiven and now they will be unforgiven together. The song then ends with the major chord, which to me indicates a happy ending where the two unforgiven souls are united and find comfort, love, and hope with each other, at least for now. Thus, The Unforgiven 2 details a story of how the narrator finds it hard to forgive the other person. All his life he has been hurt by society, so when he finds this other person, who he finally relates to, he has to search within himself to forgive her, to let her into his heart. It is difficult as he made a vow to never let his own will be taken away, yet is letting someone else into your heart not breaking this vow? How can he forgive society and by extension her when he has this vow still in place? Represented by the pain solo, he comes to the realization that of course he is tired of being alone, 
and the love and acceptance he finds in this person is actually what he wants. If he doesn't go with this person, he is actively hurting them and being the problem that he wants to escape from, being part of the dark skies, hurting the sun and closing the door off to her. Thus, he buries the key to his heart in her and they become unforgiven together. United souls. The Unforgiven 2 is a fantastic sequel to The Unforgiven 1, taking familiar elements and lyrical themes and expanding upon them, referencing the previous song without it being cheesy or ham-fisted. The story picks up on some interesting questions of trauma and how it can reverberate through one's life. Yet, despite this trauma, with enough love and acceptance, even the Unforgiven do not have to be alone. It is possible to unlock the door of their hearts and to forgive the world enough to allow yourself be loved, especially when you can find common ground and bond with the common trauma and experiences that you have had with another unforgiven person. Really just an excellent song, fantastic lyrics and themes, poignant questions, just fantastic work by Metallica. My favorite song off Reload easily, great stuff. The Unforgiven 3, composers James Hetfield, Lars Ulrich, Kirk Hammett, and Rob Trujillo, producers Rick Rubin. Alright, so finally, we are on the third and final part of this trilogy. The first Unforgiven song to feature a new member of the band, this time with Rob Trujillo on bass. Released on Death Magnetic, The Unforgiven 3 is the most different musically of the three. Notably with almost none of the common motifs from 1 and 2 being found here. These being the What I Felt lines, the twangy guitar melody, and perhaps most importantly, the opening horn sample. However, despite this, structurally, The Unforgiven 3 is actually very, very close to 1. Almost exactly the same. They return to the heavy verse, light chorus gimmick, one which I always enjoy and find very interesting. Here, despite the horn being missing, the opening piano, strings, and horn section replaces the horns. 3 then contains an opening lone guitar motif which gets repeated throughout the song before being expanded upon, which is similar to 1, and as we go through the song I will point out how similar it is in structure to 1. Really the only difference structure wise between the two is the expanded intro, expanded verse section, expanded solo section, and then shortened outro, but like I said I'll mention this as we go through it. One thing which I will mention before we get into the music so I do not need to mention it again is the production on this track. Rick Rubin is now the producer for the band rather than Bob Rock. And let's just say he and the band made some interesting decisions. I think everyone is aware of how Death Magnetic is a prime example of the quote, loudness wars and how it negatively affected the music of a lot of the bands which went this direction with their production. The production on the calm, more low energy and lighter parts of the song is fine. It is really only when the heavy guitars come in that you really notice it. You hear the guitars and drums being squashed and compressed and then being rammed as loud as possible into a limiter. There's a lot of clipping on the guitars and especially on the drums and honestly guys like this does not sound great i'm not the biggest fan of this the drums are also extremely dry sounding with very little perceivable reverb this causes them to be extremely muddy at times especially the tom hits and tom grooves which if we look back to the black album the toms were thunderous and clear but here on death magnetic the toms just sound like mud and you know to me like this isn't a deal breaker but getting through the whole album can be tiring on your ears however in small doses i think it's fine i just wish the song had the production that one was given and it would have just elevated the song so much and resulted in just a much better end product luckily there are a few fan remixes out there that fix these issues however for this we're just going to be looking at the original version that came on death magnetic the other production choice I notice here is with James Hetfield's vocals. Again, the vocals are very, very dry and very compressed. There is a ton of saturation on the vocals, as well as no harmonies whatsoever to speak of. It gives the vocals a very, very raw feeling, which is a stylistic choice I can certainly respect. And during the heavier parts of the song, I think the vocals actually sound great. They stand out and are very clear, the saturation gives them a lot of edge and aggression, and it just sounds really good in these parts. However, during the lighter parts of the song, I wish the vocal production would have been different. You really begin to notice how saturated and distorted and compressed they are during the chorus. This is when the heavy guitars go away and you're left only with the clean guitars. Search for seas of gold. How come it's got so the vocals are extremely de-essed as well, almost to the detriment of the song. De-essing is removing the harsh s and ts 
sounds, for example, and when you overdo this, the singer can sound like they have a lisp. And during the clean section of the chorus, you can really hear this on the line, search for seas of gold. Those three S's right in a row really show how the de-essing is too extreme, as James almost sounds like he has a lisp here. It almost sounds like search for she's of gold. I think a little bit of reverb, easing up on the distortion and compression of the chorus vocals would have sounded far better and served the song much more better. But, you know, again, this isn't a deal breaker, but something that is certainly noticeable and absent from previous tracks. And okay, now that that is out of the way, I just don't have to mention the production again. The song begins with a lone piano playing an E minor arpeggio. This song is in the key of E minor, different from both 1 and 2. The piano melody is interesting. It does not really sound like it, but the piano strings and brass that come in are actually playing the same chord progression as the chorus of 1 and the verses of 2. That is, if you remember, the minor 1, major 3, major 7, minor 5 progression. Except here, it is an E minor and with completely different instrumentation. Here they play E minor, G major, D major, and B minor. A nice little homage to the other songs, which is not obvious at first listen. You know, I really like the intro here, especially the addition of strings and horns. It is a very unique intro throughout Metallica's catalog of music, and honestly pretty refreshing. It's just long enough to fill its function in the song, but not long enough that it overstays its welcome. At right around 50 seconds, the intro serves to establish the key, as well as to throw back subtly to the other songs in the trilogy. You know, I think if they would have used the horn sample again, it would have been maybe too cheesy or cliche, so this is a good call. Although maybe they could have played the horn which again is playing an E and an A, which is all in the key of E minor, in the background or something else that maybe could have worked. Either way, it's cool. I like the intro. Piano and strings linger on the five chord, which is A minor, as we get a clean guitar playing this octave pattern on the low E and D strings before James hammers on the F sharp and G notes on the low E. We will see this motif used over and over throughout the song, and it almost kind of sounds like a heartbeat. The tempo is increased slightly from the intro, and now that we see his three is quite a bit faster than the previous two songs, with three being set at right around 124 beats per minute. This intro motif plays by itself for about four bars before Lars and Rob join him. Lars is playing the ride cymbal here in the intro, which is a rarity for later Metallica songs, which you can see my video on why does Lars Ulrich hate the ride cymbal for that. The bass simply plays the low E. We move into what instrumentally is the chorus, which is again, similar to one that they introduced the chorus instrumentally before the vocals come in later on. Very cool. Lars plays one of his typical grooves from the Death Magnetic era, which is complete with extra snare fills, and the octave pattern that James is playing is now elaborated on here in the little chorus section here, something which the Unforgiven One also did. Here the guitar James is playing continues to hit that high E on the D string while moving the bass note around to match what Rob on the bass is doing. I realize I did not elaborate upon this either. So in the Unforgiven One, they start with that A minor arpeggio, which is then elaborated on in the following chorus instrumentation. This is the same thing here in The Unforgiven 3 where they have this opening simple guitar motif which is then elaborated on in the chorus instrumental. So both songs have that same sort of structure there where they take an idea and then elaborate on it, which is the chorus of the song instrumental wise. Very, very cool. Kurt Hammett plays a little harmonizing arpeggio on top of this as well. This harmonizing line is pretty quiet, but on the isolated guitar tracks, you can hear it. Another interesting note, which again throws back to the Unforgiven, is the use of the major seven interval here in the song, which gives it a harmonic minor feel. They only briefly land on this note, which is D sharp, but is enough to give that small flair of harmonic minor feel to it, which again, the Unforgiven one also did. Mm -hmm. 
Great stuff and a nice little throwback. There's also what sounds to be a cello playing in the background, which is simply playing the bass notes. Cool stuff and it adds up to be a very full and sonically pleasing section, which again, like the Unforgiven 1, will be reused for the light chorus. Although similar to the Unforgiven 2, this chorus instrumentation here uses a different chord progression, not the same chord progression as the intro and the chorus of Unforgiven 1. After eight bars of this, the band again, similar to the Unforgiven 1, go briefly to that low own guitar motif before Lars gives us huge snare flam and we move on into the verse. This verse riff here is probably in the top five Metallica riffs of all time for me. It's just so groovy and heavy and melodic all at the same time. I just love it. It continues the heavy verse gimmick from one, although this time, as I mentioned earlier, it's played at a much faster pace. James sings, quote, How could he know this new dawn's light would change his life forever? Set sail to sea, but pulled off course by the light of golden treasure. Excellent lyrics, which immediately refer back to the Unforgiven 2 with this new dawn's light line. This refers back to the sun metaphor, which is all over the Unforgiven 2, where the end of the song saw the reappearance of the sun, which if you remember was a metaphor for love and acceptance. This reappearance of the sun and sounding like a sunrise is this quote, new dawn. Sound great, great metaphor. We also get the first mention of the seas here, in, as in the ocean, not seas. This is another metaphor that is used throughout the song, but we'll get to that later here in the chorus. Was he the one causing pain with his careless dreaming? Been afraid, always afraid, of the things he's feeling. Excellent lyrics, and as usual, we will go through them together at the end, but I also really like the careless dreaming line, and when combined with the vocal delivery, makes it very powerful. James here is singing in a much higher register than the previous two songs, despite the key being moved down to E. This contrast works well as it gives the verses a really unique sound and the higher pitched vocals give more energy to the actual singing. Higher notes are always registered as being louder and more filled with energy. The band lingers on specific notes here on this verse, which again, surprise surprise, reference the common chord progression between each of the songs, which again, if you remember, is that minor one, major three, major seven, minor five progression. All right, so Instead of trying to explain this over text and not have any notes, I just figured I'd grab a guitar and explain it to you guys. Essentially here, Metallica has buried the common chord progression inside the verse riff of The Unforgiven 3. And if you remember, that progression was minor 1 to the major 3 to the major 7 to the minor 5. And in The Unforgiven 3, that same progression is buried inside the verse riff, but it's in the key of E, so... If you remember, the Unforgiven 1 was in A minor. And the Unforgiven 3 here is in E minor. So that 1, 3, 7, 5 progression simply just changes notes and they bury it inside a riff. And the riff goes like this. So if you look at those, you start on the minor one, which is the E, right? E. And then it plays this little upward motion here. For landing on the E again. Before it plays the G. Now G here is the three, right? G, you'd have the G major would be that major three of E minor, right? So then you hit the G. Then it plays that little riff thing again. So now it's playing the D power chord here, which is the seven. Before it moves down to the B, which is the five. Right, so you go minor one, so. Minor one. Major three. Major seven, minor five. So it's very cool how Metallica buried that same common chord progression inside of a sick guitar riff. You know, it's really some genius stuff. And I think once you sort of peel back the Metallica onion, you really get to see the sort of genius behind their riffs. So yes, I just wanted to point that out. 
Very cool stuff. Excellent stuff by Metallica. Back to the video. Very cool use of the same progression, this time finding itself in a guitar riff, not necessarily in the same sort of big chords being played. Very, very cool. James's singing here is excellent in the verses, and the melody that it sings is very tasteful and memorable, which combined with the excellent lyrics make this verse the highlight of the song for me. He's singing higher than on the previous two songs, which is a good stylistic decision, as let's say you decided to sing the same melody, just an octave lower, it would not have really had the same impact and energy. Great stuff, and like I mentioned earlier, the production on the vocals really shine here in the verse, with all the heavy instrumentation, really allowing the vocals to stand up and be very present and right in your face. Sounds great. The band then moves on to the pre-chorus section, which again sees a few callbacks to the Unforgiven One. The guitars play power chords, and then on the following bar, they play a descending pattern, while Lars matches it with a tom pattern. This is essentially the same structure as the pre-chorus from one, except here they do not have a few bars of two for time, they just omit those. I like this little throwback, and it feels natural and forced, and the little descending pattern that they play is worthy of note too, as they use a descending chromatic pattern, which gives the riff a very off-kilter, or perhaps menacing, or lost sound to it. That'll be relevant later. On the A string, they descend from the seventh fret, which is E, to the first fret, which is A sharp, while on the E string, they go from the eighth fret, which is C, to the second fret, which is F sharp. So they do a six note descending chromatic pattern on two strings. Very cool little riff. This is also layered with a lead pattern, which Kirk plays absolutely smothered with wah pedal abuse. It all works together with the vocals to make a very, very intriguing pre-chorus. Over top of all this, James sings, he could just be gone, he would just sail on, he'll just sail on. Uh, similar to the Unforgiven One, which also uses the pre-chorus to bridge the energy gap between the heavy verse and light choruses, James's voice lowers in intensity and register. This brings us more naturally into the chorus. A nice little touch, which again sort of echoes the Unforgiven One. Again, another metaphorical reference to the C here, as, as James sings the last, quote, sail on, he holds this note as the opening motif comes back in for two bars. A drum fill from Lars then brings us into the chorus of the song. The chorus, as mentioned earlier, is essentially the same instrumentally as the first section after the intro, which again, is the same structure as the Unforgiven One. And someone count how many times I say, again, the same for this song as the one. You know, someone count it. How can I be lost if I've got no Sticking with the light chorus heavy verse gimmick, James sings at a lower register and with lower intensity, yet his voice is so raw and filled with emotion that you can really tell the lyrics for the song come from the depths of his being. James sings, How can I be lost if I've got nowhere to go? Searched for seas of gold, how come it's got so cold? How can I be lost in remembrance I relive? And how can I blame you when it's me I can't forgive? The opening line of the chorus is very memorable, and while it breaks from tradition because it does not use the line, what I've felt, what I've known, the line that they chose to use here is just as memorable. Again, we see the metaphor of the sea, which was also used in the first verse. The quote, how can I be lost, is repeated twice in the chorus. A nice use of repetition, which again echoes the Unforgiven 1 and the Unforgiven 2. Repeatedly asking the question, quote, how can I be lost, you know, really hammers that point home. The final two lines of the chorus, however, is for sure right up there with the best lyrics of Metallica's career. How can I blame you when it's me I can't forgive? Such a fantastic hook and just incredibly powerful moving lyrics. When combined with the chorus instrumentation and especially the added string melodies, gives the chorus some extra drama, which works very well and expertly with the chorus lyrics. The strings in the background are very beautiful. In addition to another cello being played, it sounds like there are some added violins or maybe violas to highlight the chords underneath the vocals. Great production choice here, which is a rarity for Death Magnetic. The strings ebb and flow with the lyrics, which reminds me of the 
seas and a boat rocking up and down with the waves. You know, go back and really listen to that and you'll kind of see what I mean. This will be important later in the lyrics. Again, similar to one, after the chorus, we get another appearance of the opening motif, which echoes one, with Lars giving us another fill to lead us into the second verse. In the second verse, James sings these lyrics. These days drift on inside a fog. It's thick and suffocating. This seeking life outside, it's hell. Inside, intoxicating. He's run aground like his life. Water much too shallow. Slipping fast, down with the ship, fading in the shadows. Again, you know, more excellent lyrics here. The way he enunciates the word suffocating, it sounds like he is almost running out of breath. And on the F sound, he is just spitting it out. Good touch. Oh, it's thinking, suffocating. It's thinking. Here again, we see a reference to the seas and boats, yet this time it's in reference to a shipwreck. This will be important later. The cadence on the lines, quote, he's run aground like his life, water much too shallow, is also superb. Ground, like his life, water much too shallow. The pause between the words life and water works with the strings that get introduced here to give that last half of the verse a very grand and dramatic feeling. The appearance of the strings is another great production choice as combined with the more explicitly downtrodden and dismal lyrics make the second verse really stand out from the first. However, the strings end abruptly as the band moves again to the pre-chorus section. Now a cast away, blame all gone away, blame gone away. Continuing the sea and shipwreck metaphors, James uses the word castaway. A castaway is someone who has been cast drift or ashore, usually after a shipwreck, and usually they are alone by themselves. An interesting choice of words here. He then repeats this blame line as we move into the second chorus, which again sees the reappearance of the intro motif. Hey, be gone. The band repeats the chorus, which for all intents and purposes is simply the same as the first time it's played, with some small variations in drumming. And before we move on to the bridge section, again similar to one the opening motif is used, but slightly changed. Here James plays the same familiar octave pattern, but rather than playing the progression which is played in the chorus instrumentation, the bass note simply goes to the 2, which is F sharp, and then to the 3, which is G, then back to the F sharp, then to E. This progression builds a lot of tension as it dwells on the two chord of the E minor scale, which being the super tonic is one of the most unstable intervals. It always wants to resolve to the E or G, yet because the band plays it twice during the pattern, it gives this a lot of built in tension. It just simply dwells on this note. This whole little bridge section here serves to build up very well to the explosive solo section. Lars playing the 16th notes on the ride cymbal combined with the volume swells from the guitar while James sings forgive me. It all just works very well together. Forgive me. Here in the first part of the bridge, James sings the whole thing on the note of E. The band then cranks it up a notch with a tom pattern being played over the top and some added strings, and James changes the melody that he sings, landing on the note of B, which is the fifth in the scale for the first time, and the second time he says forgive me, he lands on the A, which is the suspended fourth interval here. Me. All these little touches, you know, bring up the tension and energy just a little bit more. Then we get a little drum fill by Lars, and the band cranks the tension even further. We get distorted guitars playing chunky power chords, and the strings come in much louder and in a higher register than before. This all adds to the tension and drama of the buildup. James once again sings a different melody, going even higher up, ending the Forgive Me on E, and then the Forgive Me Not in the section on the D, which is the seventh of the scale. He builds this further by moving to more of a shout than a sung note as the band builds attention even further. He ends the bridge with the question, 
which is different from the other line, quote, why can't I forgive me, end quote, which lands on the B, again the fifth, which matches perfectly the note that Kirk begins his solo on. James's voice and Kirk's solo blend together so well and are almost indistinguishable from each other that it's a nice little production touch. James's voice fades right into the solo, just works well. <laughs> No, very well done in performed bridge section which really ratchets up the intensity and builds up very nicely to the huge solo which is to follow. James's pain scream, why can't I forgive me, is one of my favorite vocal moments from him. The pain in his voice is very apparent and it's a very real and raw performance of him which is actually helped by the kind of bad vocal production in my opinion. This leads us directly into the solo section, which again, similar to the Unforgiven one, uses the verse riff under it again. Although in one, they slightly changed it, here they just simply reuse it again. No matter, as it serves the solo well, as the riff has a ton, a ton of energy. Kirk's solo starts off an extremely high note as he bends up a few strings to get that B. What follows then is just a typical Kirk solo from this era. Tons of wah pedal and pentatonic licks abound. You know, it sounds great and works for the song. I'll touch on what the solo means to the story later on in the lyrics here. The solo section once again echoes the Unforgiven, one, as the band moves into the pre-chorus riff while the solo is still going on, which is the same thing that the Unforgiven one did. It descends with the descending chromatic pattern riff before resolving again on the E. All right, sorry about the scene change, clothes change, had to do the next day. Again, we see the intro motif riff appear again with James singing over top of it this time. This time though, he is singing the verse melody and lyrics over top of this elaborated intro motif line. Very cool touch to essentially combine those two sections together. I like the little walk up bass line that Rob Chihilo does as well. James sings, set sail to sea, but pulled off course by the light of golden treasure. How could he know that this new dawn's light would change his life forever? This is interesting as he essentially reverses the order in which we see the same lines from verse one, perhaps similar to the Unforgiven 2 indicating a change in heart. We'll, we'll get to that shortly. Quick little fill by Lars brings us into the third and final chorus which sees the strings play a much more prominent role around this time. Search for seas of gold. How come it's got the band then ends the trilogy with a few more cymbal hits before the guitar feedback rings out and the song ends. Very fitting and dramatic end to the song. Musically, The Unforgiven 3 is very different from the other two songs, yet despite this, when you peel back the layers of the Metallica onion, we see that yes, this song does indeed take a lot of influence and ideas from the other two songs. Especially the first Unforgiven, it simply repackages them in a much different way. As the finale in the trilogy, this works very well. If they played it too safe and took too much from the previous songs, people would have claimed it to be lazy or uninspired, which honestly is exactly the opposite of what The Unforgiven 3 is in my opinion. Excellent, excellent work by Metallica here. Alright, so on to the lyrics. I'm sure you remember when I mentioned a few hours ago that The Unforgiven 3 was essentially, quote, I cannot forgive myself. This is made rather explicitly clear in the chorus, but you know, why can't he forgive himself? What has he done that is so unforgivable? Due to the similar musical elements and being a numbered part of the Unforgiven trilogy, we can assume that the character in question here is the same character from the previous two songs, and right from the start of the lyrics we get thrown back into the story of two which if you remember was the narrator allowing another through his locked door and how they bonded over being unforgiven together. Quote, how could he know that this new dawn's light would change his life forever, end quote. I mentioned this earlier, but the opening line explicitly references the sun metaphor from the Unforgiven 2. The sun in that song was a metaphor for love and acceptance from another person. So here in the beginning of the song, the narrator lets us know that this quote, new dawn's light, end quote, changed his life. But was it for the better, or did the narrator mess it all up somehow? Quote, set sail to sea but pulled off course by the light of golden treasure, end quote. Here we see the metaphor for the first time. Setting sail to sea here is the metaphor for starting a new chapter in one's life. 
leaving land for the endless possibilities and unknowns of the sea. The past tense language being used here denotes that this has already happened. He is lamenting on this. Essentially, his new chapter of life with his quote, new dawn was beginning as they set sail into the unknown endless waters of the sea. Yet he was distracted by the quote, light of golden treasure, end quote, and lost the plot. He uses the words, quote, light of, end quote, which puts the actual existence of this golden treasure into question. Perhaps this golden treasure was simply a mirage or a false promise. This, quote, golden treasure metaphor, I believe, is about some sort of hedonistic pleasures, and you can name the vice, alcohol, drugs, etc., gambling. A lot of vices initially offer some sort of cope or relief, but often this golden treasure is nothing but fool's gold, leading only to more problems. They mention this line again later on, so we'll get back to this here when we have some more context, but let us continue on. Quote, was he the one causing pain with his careless dreaming? been afraid, always afraid, of the things he's feeling. He elaborates a little bit and relates to us that his careless dreaming was the thing that was causing pain. I assume the pain he was causing was done unto his fellow Lou Don, or the character from The Unforgiven 2 who he allowed into his heart. Careless dreaming could refer to many things, but if we look at the word careless, it is defined as not giving sufficient attention or thought to avoiding harm or errors. So, careless dreaming would be a lack of concern for the others around him as he dreams of something else. Or rephrased into normal speech, we could see this as taking his actual tangible life for granted and instead spending his time carelessly dreaming about some other reality, chasing after the golden treasure and getting lost in the process. The next lines in the stanza also reference him for given too, as the narrator here is still afraid of his own feelings. Despite the fact that he has unlocked the door to his heart and let this other person in, he still has trouble with all the associated feelings that come with sharing your life with another. You know, the feelings do not end when you let someone in. It requires further work and dedication, as well as having more and different feelings come alive inside you. Yet we know from the previous two songs Songs of dealing with these feelings is an immense challenge for the narrator due to the trauma he suffered as a young man. This is what the narrator is referencing here. Quote, he could just be gone, he would just sail on, he'll just sail on, end quote. Another reference to the sea metaphor. This is the narrator attempting to convince himself that he could just be gone. He could just leave and he would simply sail on as if nothing happened. These lines note a sense of shame or self-imposed exile. His careless dreaming about golden treasure has pulled them all off course. So would it not be better if he simply sailed off on his own? If he hurts the people around him, would they not be better off without him? Quote, How can I be lost if I've got nowhere to go? Searched for seas of gold, how come it's got so cold? End quote. I love these first few lines of the chorus here. I'm sure almost everyone can relate to the aimless lost feeling. In addition to that feeling, I think that the chorus here is also a continuation of the thoughts from the pre-chorus. A sort of way to cope. He isn't lost, he just simply has nowhere to go. I could just be gone and sail on and it would be fine. We get a repeat of the sea metaphor, except this time it is combined with the light of golden treasure lyric. It is said here that he was pulled off course by this careless dreaming of seas of gold, yet the seas of gold are not what he expected them to be. The waters turned cold, and cold water is often used as a way to achieve some sort of clarity. For instance, splashing water onto your face, but something turning cold could also be a reference to someone turning cold emotionally. Coldness also could refer to loneliness, but I will get back to this when we sum up the story in question. How can I be lost in remembrance I relive? And how can I blame you when it's me I can't forgive? The narrator repeats the line, how can I be lost? Perhaps as a cope to try to convince himself of the opposite. Remembrance is a word usually used in the context of mourning, as well as this word often being used in funeral ceremonies. So it seems to me that the narrator is actually acknowledging that whatever his past life he had with the quote, new dawn is dead and he relives this through remembering. These lines are followed by the main hook of the song. These two lines here are one of the few direct references to the other tracks. In the other two tracks, the word forgive, which is contained within the word unforgiven, are used in the last lines of the chorus, and here we see something similar yet very different at the same time. Here the narrator reveals that it is himself he cannot forgive. Perhaps he wants to blame his partner for some of what happened, yet it is himself who must bear the blame alone. In a sense here, confirming that he is indeed the unforgiven, which echoes the first and second songs. I think this is a great way to tie the song directly to the other songs in the trilogy, and it's some very clever songwriting in my opinion. Quote, These days drift on inside a fog. It's thick and suffocating. This seeking life outside its hell, inside intoxicating. 
End quote. These next few lines in the verse detail the internal suffering that the narrator feels from his guilt from letting himself be taken off course. The fog he is in keeps him lost and aimless. We can imagine a lone ship on the open sea surrounded by a thick blanket of fog, aimless drifting with no direction. He remarks that this fog feels suffocating. I really personally have relate to this as, as before this channel began to take off, I was simply lost in a daze, drifting through life aimlessly with no northern star to point the ship of my life towards. Feeling aimless and drift in a featureless fog is very vivid and poignant imagery powerful stuff from the band. Quote, this seeking life outside its hell, end quote, is an interesting line. Here he acknowledges the damage that he is doing to his life and those around him by chasing this, quote, golden treasure, end quote. Yet inside he acknowledges that he finds his golden treasure intoxicating. This is very typical of addictive behavior where the person who is suffering from their addiction is fully aware that it is ruining their life, yet they simply cannot stop themselves. They are intoxicated by the addiction itself. If you know anyone who has suffered from addiction, you know exactly what I am talking about. This is what makes the disease of addiction so painful, not only for the person suffering, but for those around the person who in many cases are powerless to stop it. Quote, He's run aground like his life, water much too shallow, slipping fast, down with the ship, fading in the shadows. End quote. The ship metaphor is back and in much more explicit terms here. A ship running aground is when a ship finds itself in water that is far too shallow and thus the bottom of the boat rams into the ground underneath the water, causing damage and getting the boat stuck in the process. This could be intentional, however, it most often happens due to the navigators and captains of the vessel becoming lost or misjudging where they are, which is an apt description of addiction, especially if the person suffering has some delusions about just how bad their disease has gotten. I also believe running aground is simply another way to say that the narrator has hit rock bottom. Literally rocks are now slamming into the bottom of the vessel. You could imagine that the boat of his life is sailing on and a thick fog lost, all alone. Yet the narrator is still intoxicated by the allure of golden treasure, still searching for it. The sea floor, or rock bottom in this case, is obscured by the waters around him, and he finds himself unaware of the shallow waters that him and his boat are in. And he hits rock bottom unexpectedly. The unexpected rock bottom experience is also typical for people suffering with addiction. Quote, slipping fast, down with the ship, fading in the shadows, end quote. The ship of his life is sinking and he's going down with it. No longer in the light of his, quote, new dawn, end quote, he now finds himself fading away in the shadows, in the dark again. Very clever metaphors and references here. Quote, now a cast away, blame all gone away, blame gone away, end quote. Forced to abandon the sinking ship, the narrator finds himself alone, cast away on an island all by himself. Once again, alone and unforgiven. The blame he placed upon others is all gone away and he is left with no one but himself. Sadly, this is the outcome for many people who suffer from addiction. The alienation of those around them effectively makes them a castaway in their own life. This is juxtaposed with the first chorus lines in which the narrator is thinking everyone would be better off, himself included, if he simply sailed away from everyone. Yet, due to hitting rock bottom and running aground his ship in his life, he now gets his wish, whether he wants it or not. I think this comparison is the manifestation of guilt. An addict whose behavior is creating hell for themselves often feels as if everyone would be better off without them. I do not want to say the word as I don't want to get demonetization ganked, but the thoughts of self-deletion occur here as well. This is the true meaning to the line him saying, quote, he could just be gone, which also relates to some of the other themes on Death Magnetic itself. Guilt manifests itself in strange ways, yet he does not commit to this act and finds himself alone regardless. The chorus repeats and then we find ourselves in the bridge section. Here the narrator repeats the lines of, forgive me, forgive me not. We can imagine the narrator broken from his chase of the golden treasure, alone as a castaway in the shadows he created, pleading with himself to forgive himself, yet he cannot forgive himself. Forgive me, forgive me not. To me, this brings back the old schoolyard game of she loves me, she loves me not, where if you're not really familiar with this, where someone uses the petals of a flower to determine if attraction or love is reciprocated. Flower petals are plucked off with each repeat of she loves me and she loves me not. Whichever line remains unsaid when the flower runs out of petals is the answer. To me, this always seemed like a way to defer responsibility for something that you could have influence on and defer this to the universe, to God or to chance, you know, whatever you want to call it. This is what I believe the Ben is referencing here with this section, and perhaps we can look at the narrator deferring his own responsibilities to some other power, an attempt to perhaps earn some forgiveness. If the universe gives him a sign, if the petals run out on forgive me, then perhaps it is possible. And this represents the desperation that the narrator is in. Yet, 
The desperation in the narrator's voice grows as he continues to repeat this. He desperately wants forgiveness. This combines musically with the build-up into the solo. How James's voice increases in franticness, the instruments building up the tension and the strings increasing the drama. This all accumulates into the climax of the song when the narrator realizes it is him who must forgive himself and it is not the universe's responsibility to do so. He cries out in agony, why can't I forgive me? James's voice and Kirk's solos fade perfectly into each other, representing that the guitar solo solo that follows is simply an extension of the story. This solo here represents the internal battle and struggle that the narrator faces cast away in the shadows all by himself. Many people know this battle well. When rock bottom hits, you must face your own shadows and demons. Confront yourself and the reasons for your behavior and do a lot of extremely painful soul searching and self reflection. You can hear the pain in the solo. It is heart wrenching and soul changing event in a person's life. However, the solo does not end on a triumphant note. It almost spirals down with the descending chromatic pattern from the pre-chorus. This I think is a very apt representation of the struggles within, as well as all the self-deletion thoughts that come along with this. Yet despite all the struggle, as the solo ends, the octave riff from the intro motif remains, which if you remember from earlier I described as a heartbeat. The narrator has made it out of life. This titanic internal struggle is not resolved yet, but the narrator is still here and that is what is important. After the solo we get a repeat of the lyrics and melody from verse 1, except the order of these lines are reversed. Quote, Set sail to sea, but pulled off course by the light of golden treasure. How could he know that this new dawn's light would change his life forever? End quote. Which in comparison to the first verse, which was phrased like this, quote, How could he know that this new dawn's light would change his life forever? Set sail to sea, but pulled off course by the light of golden treasure. End quote. The rearrangement of these lines is very, very clever, as it essentially ends the verse on a more positive, hopeful note rather than the dismal outlook that was first presented. Rather than being the light of the new dawn and then pulled off course, instead, he is already off course, and this quote, new dawn is now changing his life forever. He has a new dawn to aim towards. It's a very clever distinction and some extremely clever songwriting. Huge props to the band for this. Truly genius tier songwriting, and I absolutely love this. That quote, new dawn, end quote, could be the same person that he led into his heart or perhaps it is something new completely different the chorus repeats but now in a different context how can he be lost if he has nowhere to go can now be looked at as the journey of his life brought him here for a reason he is no longer lost he is right where he deserves to be his search for those seas of gold brought him to this lonely and cold place he remembers and relives his past life and how all his decisions had led him to where he is now. How can he blame the other person when it is him he cannot forgive? But rather than lamenting this fact like the previous, he now accepts this fact. Going full circle, he is now the unforgiven to himself. And that is all right. A new dawn's light is upon him, and despite the fact that he still cannot forgive himself, he learns that he must accept his actions, accept the consequences, and move on from it. The new dawn's light metaphor can now be viewed as a fresh start, a brand new day which comes with brand new possibilities and potential for healing. Thus, in summary, The Unforgiven 3 is a story about how the narrator character was led astray from his quote, New Dawn, quote, which he had found in The Unforgiven 2 and had finally let them in through the closed door of his heart. He was led astray by the mirage of golden treasure and golden seas, which I think is clearly a reference to addiction of some sort. The narrator then goes lower and lower, feeling all the guilt that comes along with it. Like many addicts who are aware of how their actions are causing hell in their life, they are intoxicated by it and cannot be free of the lure of the golden treasure, despite the awareness of what is going on. He's painfully aware of the fact and finds himself lost and alone in the fog of life. He knows he is to blame, and this is evidenced by the line, quote, how can I blame you when it's me I can't forgive, end quote. His addiction finally reaches a breaking point as he hits rock bottom. In the rock bottom state in which he finds himself, he is alone. He faces the depths of himself and comes out the other side alive which in some cases is about as good as you can actually hope for. He then finds himself another, quote, new dawn, a new day, and despite the fact that he cannot forgive himself, he must sail on. All in all, The Unforgiven 3 is my favorite of the trilogy. The verse riff is just so groovy and heavy, the lyrics are absolutely fantastic, and the metaphors ring painfully true. The song borrows elements from the previous two songs, yet it is not obvious that it does. It continues the story of the previous two without resorting to cliches used in the other songs. And despite this, the band gives us just enough to make sure we know it is part of the trilogy. Just a masterful song, and easily my favorite song of Death Magnetic. James has said that this is by far the most personal of the three, and this will be the last song of the trilogy. I must say, well done and thank you to the band for creating such a bold song and for writing such vulnerable and painful lyrics.
the three songs together. All right, well, finally we get to this section. I appreciate you all sticking around here with me. So let us now tackle the daunting question of what is the whole trilogy trying to tell us? If we go back to the start of this, I said that the Unforgiven one was, I cannot forgive them. The Unforgiven 2 was I Cannot Forgive You, and The Unforgiven 3 was I Cannot Forgive Myself. But from a bird's eye perspective, it details the broad story of a man who has to deal with guilt and forgiveness throughout his life. From childhood, quote, new blood joins us earth, to the young adult years where he must forgive society enough to let a partner join him, all the way to the twilight years of adulthood where he faces the ultimate adversary, which is himself. It details the social pressures and trauma that the boy suffers growing up in, quote, constant pain, disgrace, end quote, and how he vows to remain true to himself and to never let another control his thoughts and his soul again. I believe the old man mentioned here is another unforgiven man, quote, that old man is me, end quote, and that seeing this old man die with regrets is a dire warning, and this warning is heeded by the narrator, although with much struggle. In The Unforgiven 2, it details the young man as he finds a partner who he believes is also part of The Unforgiven, quote, Unforgiven 2, end quote. Yet despite this, he struggles intensely to allow himself to open the, quote, locked door, end quote, and to allow this person, as well as the feelings of love, hope, and acceptance, which if we remember is represented by the sun and its light, or as it is put in The Unforgiven 3, quote, the new dawn's light, into his heart and soul. The only reason this is even possible for the narrator is because of that old man he saw dying with many regrets. Without this dire warning, the narrator probably would not be able to overcome his trauma. He probably would not have considered this even a possibility. The narrator battles within himself and his soul, represented by the solo in The Unforgiven 2, and eventually manages to throw the door open and accept the partner, accept the sun and light into his life, and fully dedicate and trust this person. Quote, I'll take this key and I'll bury it in you. End quote. However, as most people are aware, the trauma suffered as one grows up never really goes away. It is carried with the person through the rest of their life. This trauma often bubbles up to the surface and leads the person to depression, mental illness, and of course here in The Unforgiven 3, addiction. Quote, drawn off course by the light of golden treasure, end quote. Here in The Unforgiven 3, it takes place after the narrator, quote, buries his key, end quote, in the other unforgiven person. Quote, how could he know that this new dawn's light would change his life forever? End quote. They set sail to sea, which in the beginning here represents a new start, sailing away from land into the grand possibilities of the wide open sea. However, the trauma suffered under the oppressive and controlling upbringing spills over into the narrator's life and he gets pulled off course. The golden treasure, as I explained earlier, represents addiction. The allure of something that makes you lose control. The narrator had little control over his childhood upbringing and was constantly told what to do and what to say. So the idea, this temptation of losing control, quote, with his careless dreaming, is the golden treasure, which manifests itself by addiction to something that puts him out of control. The narrator also has repressed feelings, which he's afraid to feel, which of course does not help this situation at all. Thus, as he's led off course, he creates hell around him, which he's fully aware of, quote, this seeking life outside its hell, inside intoxicating, end quote. It hurts the person he loves, yet in his current state he is powerless to stop it. He feels immense guilt. Quote, How can I blame you when it's me I cannot forgive? And despite being fully cognizant of all this, he cannot control himself. Thus he thinks to himself, perhaps everyone would be better off without him. Metaphorically, and literally. I also just want to point this out that the, quote, you, end quote, he cannot forgive could be many people. The people who raised him, his partner, society, or perhaps everything. God, whatever you want to call it. As I explained far earlier, English has this unique problem where the second and third person plural identifiers are the same. How can I blame you can mean you individually, or it can mean you as in everyone. This vagueness is intentional, as in The Unforgiven One, they specifically use the word the, which identifies it as a second person identifier. As the addiction gets worse, the narrator finds himself trapped alone at sea in a suffocating fog until he runs aground, a metaphor for rock bottom. For you here, he does something to hurt them, or it was the last straw for his partner, it doesn't really matter as he truly finds himself alone now. Cast away with no one to blame besides himself, he finds himself not in the light of the sun, but in the darkness of the shadows. This is the rock bottom. This dark shadow is where the narrator pleads with the universe for forgiveness, yet ultimately he learns that he must shoulder all the blame himself, accept what he has done is wrong, and find a new light, a quote, a new dawn's light, end quote, to follow. The trilogy ends with the line again, quote, how can I blame you when it's me I can't forgive, which is an apt ending to the story. The narrator realizes finally that even if he forgives everyone else, he must also forgive himself. 
and whether or not he does is left ambiguous, suggesting that this is an eternal struggle, one which the narrator will always be challenged with. Essentially, the story that is trying to be told here is one of pain, trauma, pressure, love, hope, guilt, and acceptance. There are several morals and lessons to the lyrics that they try to get across here. You cannot let others control you, and in the same vein, you cannot let your bitterness to these people control your life, lest you die regretfully. You must be able to forgive the wrongs done to you enough to be able to accept love and to receive acceptance in return, and finally, ultimately, regardless of the wrongs done to you and the trauma you have suffered, you must forgive yourself to be able to find a new dawn in your life. You must forgive yourself to regain control in your own life. However, this is only my interpretation of the lyrics and story presented to us here. I would truly love to read your thoughts down below on what the band was trying to present here. And what are your thoughts on the story here? Am I right? Do you think I missed some things? You know, let me all know down in the comments down there. I know a lot of what is said in these songs is very personal to James Hetfield. And like I said, I purposely did not bring any of his upbringing or stories into this as I feel the music really stands on its own. And we do not need any other information to complete the story here. But I mean, the man really went through it as a child. I'm sure if you were truly curious, you can find many sources and books which touch upon these matters, but for me, the music and lyrics speak loud enough. One of the marks of great art is how deeply it can move you and how deeply it can make you reflect on the things that have happened in your own life. While I do not want to get too personal here, I find a lot of these songs I relate almost directly to a family member. I especially find the lyrics in Unforgiven 3 to be very compelling thought-provoking and painful. It is not easy to forgive yourself by any means, and the song represents that fact very, very well. Musically as well, the band manages to give every song its own identity and unique qualities while keeping them all related. The same chord progression used in all three songs is the biggest example of this, while one and three share almost the exact same structure. Lyrical motifs appear throughout the songs as well. Each song is very, representa each song is very representative of the various Metallica eras as well, with the Unforgiven One representing the ultimate Paul and production of the Black Album, with its huge drums, massive guitar tone, and tons of added percussion and other elements throughout. James's voice is untrained and undamaged here, so the grit on his voice during the heavy verse contrasts expertly with the softly and beautifully sung chorus. The twangy western-influenced guitars and classical-esque guitar playing add up to an absolute masterpiece of production and songwriting. The Unforgiven 2 takes the Metallica sound and adds in more country and grunge elements, the B-Bender guitar riff being the best element of this, as well as the much drier and less Paul sound of the drums feels very late 90s in sound. It takes a lot of familiar elements and changes them subtly to produce an excellent, excellent sequel. One which actually ends us on a happy note. The Unforgiven 3 then represents the Death Magnetic era Metallica. Looking for redemption after the early 2000s debacles the man had faced, it is extremely raw, very compressed and loud. It's angry and hurt. James's vocals are the least polished of the three with no harmonies to speak of. The solo is frantic and the most shreddy of them all. And yet despite this, it retains the grand production elements from the other tracks, notably the piano intro and the various strings used to accentuate various parts of the song. Thus, the Unforgiven trilogy is similar to many other series and other media. They take a successful original idea, and expand and extrapolate upon this idea. The character story continues through the series and familiar elements appear throughout. The direct sequel borrows much more heavily and is more connected musically and motif-wise to the original, while the third takes the basic structure and characters and takes it in a completely new direction, but one that still feels a part of the broader series. All in all, the Unforgiven trilogy stands out to me as a fantastic trio of songs from the biggest metal band in the world. The first song gets tons of love, but I feel like two and three are criminally underrated, especially number three. And well, this was the Unforgiven Trilogy Retrospective. My name is Varvis, and if you made it all the way through this video, you have my sincere thanks. Let me know which song of the three is your favorite in the comments, so I know you made it this far. If you want to see more very in-depth videos like this one, let me know as well. There are a few albums I would like to do something, something similar on, most of it will be a couple death albums. So if you guys like this, maybe I will do those in the future. You know, make sure to like, consider joining my Patreon, hit that subscribe button, and so long and good night.